if you're not dead, God's not done with you. If there is breath in your lungs, there is purpose for your life in the name of Jesus. If you're willing to step into it. Welcome to the Pax Christian Church podcast. We are so glad you've joined us today. And we pray that this message speaks to you and encourages you and challenges you to live for Jesus with everything that you have. Stick around after the message. We'd love to find out how we can connect with you and be praying for you. Here's this week's message from our Sunday gathering. I have a confession that won't seem like much of a revelation to anybody who spent much time with me. Um, but uh, I tend to procrastinate. Um, I have the spiritual gift of procrastination. That's not a gift. Um, uh, I, yeah, just, you know, what can be done tomorrow can be put off until the day after that. Uh, <laughs> And it, it's not a great trait. That's why I started with a, I have a confession. Um, and, um, you know, in general, I have an ability to activate like turbo mode and get things done uh, at the last minute, but uh, sometimes not so much. And it, it shows up in a lot of ways that are very inconvenient um, in my life. And then looking at my walk with the Lord and my life in general, sometimes I feel like I have procrastinated my whole life. Like not just in like, oh, that thing was due and I waited until the last five minutes to get it turned in. Uh, or, you know, begging the teacher, like it was only 20 minutes overdue. You could still take it. Uh, not a great way to go through it, but So I, um, when I, when I first went, went to college, when I graduated high school, uh, I didn't have a whole lot of concern about what I was going to do with myself. I just kind of felt like, uh, you know, if I could just make enough money to pay rent in whatever, like I'll have 10 roommates, I don't care. If I can just make enough money to pay rent and eat once in a while, then, you know, and still like afford to replace my skateboard when it breaks, uh, that's probably pretty good. I'll be fine with that. And, you know, like as an idiot teenager, you don't always comprehend like, you know, there will be a day where skateboarding is not really an option, like physically, like I fall and like the ground got a lot harder and, uh, it, since I was a teenager because I used to jump off big stairs and hit the ground and just get back up and run back to the top and do it again and like not care that I was hurting and just be like, oh, the adrenaline will keep the pain away. You know, my ankles this big. I'm like, no biggie. And, uh, you know, I'll get over it, you know, and maybe I'll eat one Advil later and it'll be fine. And that was like as much as I would ever worry about it. And then, you know, my early 20s when I would fall uh, skateboarding, I wouldn't even take a very hard slam. And I would be like, I don't know what happened, but I feel like, you know, a truck hit me on the way down. Like, And it, I mean, it hurt for days. And now I, I fall. And um, some of you may remember uh, last summer, I think it was last summer, I fell off a one wheel. Uh, one of those things where it's got a single wheel. That's why it's called a one wheel in the middle and then kind of a balance step pedal on either side. And you lean on it to go. And I was riding one of those and I buried the front end and fell and I bruised my ribs. And I mean, I struggled to breathe for like six weeks. And I mean, it hurt. And uh, I wasn't, it didn't feel right for probably three months. Um, I still had, you know, pain like every time I reached or, you know, played guitar or sang or anything. Um, and so as I was uh, going into all that to say, as I was going into uh, college, I kind of felt like, ah, whatever, I'll figure it out as I go. And so I was taking community co college courses. And pretty quickly, I found that I loved photography. And I was getting into photography, and it was a way that I could still like be involved in skateboarding and snowboarding without having to be the guy jumping off the 100-foot cliff. I could take photos of the guy jumping off the 100-foot cliff. <laughs> and I was still there, and I was part of it. And like I was the one who got to like bring receipts, like, look what happened. This was cool. And, and I didn't have to be the guy like killing myself to do it. Um, and I got all the way to where I'd been through you know, more of college than you should have to be in community college. And, uh, but was finally like, okay, I'm going to go to art school. 
I'm going to, I'm going to go and be a photography major. And I was looking at a school and I don't know if you've ever looked into art school, but like, you know, college can get pretty expensive and art school is like, wait, hold my beer. Uh, I can, I can show you what expensive looks like. And, um, just the materials to buy or rent the camera equipment that I was going to need to go to the school was going to be like six figures. Wow. Like it was some serious student loans I was looking at. And then beyond that, the tuition was at least that. And so like I was looking at probably walking away with something that like should lead me to a career where that might not be a problem to pay off. Um, although knowing some of the people who did go to that school, I'm looking at it going, that, uh, that could have been dangerous. Um, but I was poised. I mean, I was uh, like applied and deposited and planned and ready to move and go to photography school and probably walk away with like a, I mean, if we're being realistic, like a quarter million dollars in debt. Like, and that it's insane to think of those kind of numbers. But, uh, but that's what it was going to cost to go to photography school. Well, in the time between when I first signed up for that and when I, was ready to leave South Lake Tahoe where I'd grown up and, uh, and moved to photography school. Uh, I had met Jesus and, um, I didn't, um, you know, I, I, I didn't start off just knowing him and, and doing all of this, but, um, and so in, in my late teens, <laughs> early twenties, I started going to church. I came to faith in Christ. And so I'm 21 and about ready to head off to photography school, but, feeling very strongly this call to pastoral ministry and having no context for that, had no idea how to get into it, didn't know what Bible college was. I thought that meant like you take religion courses in school. And so um, uh, ended up transferring to a different community college in Southern California and took philosophy of religion, thinking that would eventually <laughs> lead to it. That's not how that works. Um, that's, that's a very different experience. Um, <laughs> So if you're thinking about Bible college and a pastoral vocation, that's not the route to go. You, it, it doesn't work that way. Uh, unhelpful. But, but so I, I, I went into, I, I realized that, okay, if I go to art school and do all of this and then go into pastoral ministry, not only have I wasted that education, but I'm going to be a lot in debt. And as far as I'm aware, that's not really like a big money industry. So I'm not going to like come out of that and be like, all right, now I'm going to go be a pastor paying off that debt. No problem. It's not a good, it wouldn't have worked. So I didn't go to photography school. But then as I started trying to figure it out, I realized like the people around me that were in the place where I was trying to figure out like how to move from just living life to figuring out some sort of Bible school or something and, and being equipped and, and prepared and, and sent or called or, or hired to be a pastor I, at 21, 22, 23, as I'm trying to work this out, I'm way behind, like way behind everybody. And I'm, I'm hanging out with, you know, like 18 year olds that are, you know, interning and, and volunteering and figuring out, you know, serving alongside me in youth ministry and, and whatnot as a volunteer, like I am, we're at the same level of stuff but they're going back to school in the fall at their Bible college. And I'm like, how do you get into one of those? Like, I don't know about these. And, and I remember even asking that, but I had so little context. I didn't even like phrase it right. And so the people I asked didn't know how to answer the question and weren't able to really help me out. Not for lack of desire. They just didn't really get what I was trying to say. And, and so it, it went on a few years, but I feel like that just kind of became my, thing in life where I was looking around at the people who were at the same stage of what I was doing and looking at my peers and realizing like, I'm years older than them. Like I'm, I'm getting into this late. I'm, I'm, I don't know why, but I'm just so far behind. And I, and I kept feeling like, man, I, I, I this is not, this is not encouraging. This feels like I missed something. So I got saved when I was 21. I, I got my bachelor's degree finally in Bible and theology when I was 38. Um, before that, I finally got hired full time as a youth pastor when I was 30 years old. When I went to my first like youth network meeting and hung out with other youth pastors, there were 
two guys in the group that were older than me and they're going to be youth pastors until they die. Like they're going to be buried in cargo shorts and a superhero t-shirt. Like they're, um, they're going to be youth pastors, you know, like in the afterlife, like they're going to, they, they will always be middle school leaders. And then there were a couple of guys my age who were like feeling, who were all of their comments and complaints were like, I'm too old for this. I can't pull these all nighters at the lock-ins anymore. I, I'm ready for something else. I've been doing this a while. I'm, I'm looking to step into the next thing that God has for me. And, and I'm going like, I've been here three weeks. I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> what do you mean you're leaving? Like, how do I do this? And then everyone that was as new to it as me was like 10 years younger and like finishing school. And I'm going, I don't have a degree yet. I'm trying to figure this out. I'm just being faithful to what God has called me to, but I also feel like I'm out of place and I'm way behind on all of this. 30 years old, my, my youth leaders at that first church, I turned 30 two months into my job and they gave me a walker for my, uh, <laughs> for my birthday. Um, which then we proceeded to like jump over and play around on. But, uh, but it, it felt like kind of fitting, like, dang, I'm too old for this already. And I just started, uh, when, when I, when I moved to Tucson, I was 36 and I was one of the oldest youth pastors in Tucson. And, um, a lot of people start asking like, when are you going to move to something else? And I knew that I had this calling that, uh, you know, that I, I always loved this idea of planting a church or something, but I wasn't sure like when or if that was going to happen. And I wasn't really in a rush to do it as much as I was just like, okay, God, whatever you want to do with me, I'll serve. I'll serve in youth ministry for the rest of my life if that's where you want me, or we'll plant a church or we'll do whatever. Or I'll lead a church, like wherever you want me, God, I will serve. But there's also this nagging commentary running that I'm behind. To top all that off, not that I'm really one for comparison all the time, but um, I saw an article uh, when I was like 34. So I've been a few years in ministry at that point, right? Full-time ministry. And um, I saw an article that was talking about like the four biggest churches, fastest growing churches in the country. And there was one in each corner of the country. And it was guys like, you know, uh, I think um, Carl Lentz was one of them at the time and before he fell. And so, you know, maybe that's telling him anyway. Uh, and then, um, uh, Rich Wilkerson Jr. And Judah Smith. And I forget the other guy, but, uh, they're pointing at, you know, it's like these four like big name pastors that everybody thought was like the coolest people. And they're leading the biggest, trendiest churches in the country. And they're, you know, all these celebrities go to their churches and everything. And, and I mean, these churches all have like more than one number before the comma in the number of people that attend the church. Like these are massive churches and they're growing rapidly. Every one of those guys was within 12 months of my age. It was like, cool. <laughs> I'm like not even in charge of the youth ministry I serve in. What am I doing right now? Like what have, what have I to offer? Like I'm so far behind. Like there's, and there's all this talk of like, Hey, don't forget to let the next generation like come up. You got to let the 20 something speak. And I'm like, but I haven't even got my shot yet. Like, why am I going to give it to some 20 year old? Like I haven't got there yet. I'm not doing anything yet. Is how it felt a lot. So I got my bachelor's degree in Bible and theology at 38. I got, you know, we came back here and planted a church when I was 40. And then every time, every time we, you know, we hit something and I look at the milestone and I think about where I'm at and I talk to somebody else and, you know, or I'm sharing with another pastor or something and, and they talk about how they did that same thing. And, you know, there's some encouragement and then they're like, yeah, man, I remember when I was 32 and, and we planted our church and I'm like, shut up. And, yeah, and I just feel like I'm behind on it. And over and over, God, um, you know, wraps me on the head spiritually and points me back to these same people over and over because I'm not learning this lesson very well. So we're going to preach through it today. Um, we're in Hebrews 11. And we're just going to look at two verses in there today, and then we're going to jump into Genesis for a while. In Hebrews 11, starting in verse 11, 
This is following up where uh, Pastor Mandy left off last week talking about how by faith Abraham and, and all these things that Abraham had done and he, and he stepped out. And, and we'll read through just a piece of that today. But it continues as a part of Abraham's story, and by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. She considered God faithful. And so from this one man, and he as good as dead, came descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and as countless as the sand on the seashore. By faith, they were able to do this. By faith, Sarah, who was past childbearing age, she got into the game late. She watched the date come and go and and then fade into memory. And still, and yet by faith, God used Sarah and Abraham to do incredible things and to fulfill his promises Faith, as we've read in Hebrews 11.1, 1, is the confidence in what we hope for and assurance about what we do not see. And if we back up just a little farther in Hebrews 10, verse 23 says, let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. I want to sum that up with a line from a song that we'll sing after uh, to close out our service today. Is, Look, if you're not dead, God's not done with you. If there is breath in your lungs, there is purpose for your life in the name of Jesus. If you're willing to step into it. God is not done with you if you still have breath, if you still have life. If you're not dead, God's not done with you. And that's something I easily forget and need to be reminded of a lot. And because he's kind and gracious, he does. He does remind me. Genesis 12, verse 1. Pastor Mandy read this. I just want to uh, hit it for context. The Lord had said to Abram, his name's Abram right now. The name Abram means exalted father. Feels like kind of a dig probably every time somebody says his name and he has no kids. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he set out from Haran. He was 75 when he started this. And this is getting to where, like, if you, when we read through the earlier parts of Genesis and you read the timelines, like, it's like, no, it was 600 when he started having kids. You're like, well, hold on. That was, hey, that's a couple more hundreds than, you know, anyone else gets ever. And, and so <clears throat> they were just built different back then. The timelines were different. Sorry, hang on. I need a little water. Um, but now we're getting in with Abraham. We're getting closer to like the standard, you know, uh, understandable lifespan. So now in, in his seventies, Abraham's already kind of past the time where like having kids is on the menu. But God gives him this promise and says, I'm going to make a great nation through you. And I'm going to bless everybody with you. And so Abraham goes and, and he does a bunch of stuff. He, he takes a lot with him. They, they move around. Abraham's kind of a moron and, and keeps like selling his wife to every king that they hang out with and tell him like, oh, this is my sister. And then they marry her. And then God's like, I will kill you. Don't do that. And then the king's like, oh, hold up. Hey, your God told me that that's your wife. What were you doing to us? And so Abram's not the best guy, but in general, he does have this redeeming quality where he keeps believing God and trusting in him. And I don't know about you, but when I see flawed people who get to follow Jesus, I get real excited because if it was just for the perfect ones, I'm out like every day. So it, 
thank God he puts up with broken, foolish people who are not very good at following him because I get to follow him. (laughs) We jump ahead to Genesis 15, verse 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram. I am your shield, your very great reward. But Abram said, Sovereign Lord, what can you give me? (sighs) The sassy comment to Yahweh. (sighs) What can you give me since I remain childless and the one who will inherit my estate as Eliezer of Damascus? What are you going to give me? I'm in my late 70s. I got nothing going for me. I'm watching all this stuff happen. And all I have is this servant. I have nobody else. I'll just pass it on to him, I guess. Is that what you meant when you said you were going to give me, turn me into a great nation? You're just going to like have a bunch of dudes take over my corporation and that's going to be the, the legacy I leave behind? Abraham or, and Abram said, you've given me no children, so a servant in my household will be my heir. Then the word of the Lord came to him. This man will not be your heir, but a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And he took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. And then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it, it, credited it, goodness, Abraham believed the Lord, and he credited it to him as righteousness. It was credited. I still can't say that right. It was counted as righteousness. Abraham believed God, and it was counted as righteousness. If you read the intervening chapters, we read the beginning of 12. If you read the rest of 12, 13, 14, into 15, there's very little about Abram that's righteous. The guy is like just a dude who's trying to get by and kind of willing to scheme a little bit and do a little bit here and there to, to make it happen and, and, and get through and, and try not to, try not to get killed in the process. And I'm not saying to justify your bad behavior or immorality, but instead to say it's not our worst moments that we're judged by when it comes to God. It's whether or not we put our faith in Him. And he calls us out of those dark things if we'll trust him. But God promises that, no, I'm going to give you a flesh and blood heir. Trust me. Abraham believes him, and it counts as righteousness. God is faithful. Trust him. It counts as righteousness. If you're not dead, God's not done with you. So look at chapter 16. It's been 10 years since that promise, and Abraham and Sarah are getting a little sketched out about God coming through. So they're going to take things into their own hands. Now Sarai, Abraham's, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abram, the Lord has kept me from having children, so go sleep with my slave, and perhaps I can build a family through her. I'll just take her kids, but they'll be your children. They'll be your flesh and blood. God will fulfill his promise through this. Abram agreed to what Sarai said. So after Abram had been living in Canaan 10 years, Sarai, his wife, took her Egyptian slave, Hagar, and gave her to her husband to be his wife. And he slept with her and she conceived. When she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. And then Sarai said to Abraham, Abram, you are responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. (laughs) Hold on. Whose idea was this? Like, I know it's been a minute. Like, for us, it's like one more paragraph. For her, that's probably like months later. But still, whose idea was this? Hey, Abram, here, have her. This will work, and then maybe I can have kids. She gets pregnant. This is your fault. Wait a minute. I mean, like, nobody is, like, exactly righteous and spotless here, but also, no. Well, she's upset. You're responsible for the wrong I'm suffering. I put my slave in your arms, and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. (laughs) Uh, Your slave is in your hands, Abram said. Do with her whatever you want. Then Sarai mistreated her, so she fled from her. 
The angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarai, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. Does that sound familiar? Even though y'all did this the wrong way, I'm going to fulfill part of that promise. I am faithful, and I will do this thing. But it's still not the promise that God had for them. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you're now pregnant, you'll give birth to a son. You'll name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. And Ishmael is a, um, a, a name that means God hears. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. A lovely blessing. <laughs> Again, this is not the promise God had. He's going to bring blessing, but it's not what he had intended for them. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her. You are the God who sees me. That is why the well was called Be'er Lahai Roy. It is still there between <coughs> Kadesh and Bered. And so Hagar bore Abram a son, and Abram gave the name Ishmael to the son she had born. Abram was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. So I waited about 10 years before I became a youth pastor compared to when a lot of other people are, you know, 20, 21, 22, and they're new youth pastors, and they're figuring it out. And I'm 30, and most 30-year-old youth pastors are like, I'm old, and everything hurts, and I'm out of here. And it's time to be an associate pastor. I'm like, I don't know. I just got started. I better do this for a minute. And so I did. And I still love youth ministry, and I still uh, enjoy hanging out with the youths. But Man, I, so many times in that time, I felt like this is taking forever. What have I done? I'm way behind. I can't even imagine for Abram going every time his knees pop completely when he's getting up. You know, every time he's, you know, it, his wife is feeling very sore and they're, they're both feeling their age and going, I don't know when this whole like having a baby thing is going to happen because this is getting tough, you know, <laughs> like starting to walk a little crooked and to give up and try to make it happen. Okay, well, maybe this is what God wanted to do, but it's not what God had promised. I get it. I don't approve of it. We can see that it's not what God wanted, but I get it. And I don't think it's very hard to land there if we're being honest. So when Abraham, now when Abram was 99 years old, Ishmael's 13. Abram's looking around like still nothing with Sarah. The Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between me and you and will greatly increase your numbers. Hold on. You already made the covenant between me and you. But Abram's not walking blamelessly with God. He's not trusting in God. He did believe him. And then he was like, yeah, but it's been a minute. Like you were late. So I'm not believing you anymore. And I'm going to do my own thing. And God's like, I will bless you in this, but it's not what I had for you. I have this other plan for you. And I'm going to do that anyway, but you need to step up. You need to follow me. And that's what it means when he says, walk before me faithfully and be blameless. It's not about be perfect so I can be impressed with you. It's stop turning away to everything else. Just follow me. I have the way for you. Go this way. It's like my dog. When I wake her up at night and I need her to go to bed, but I don't trust her because she's a puppy and she chews everything that's not hers. And so she's sleeping on the floor like super innocently right until we give up and walk away and then she's going to find something to chew on. And so... I let her out to go to the restroom and then I go and I'm like, okay, time to go to bed. And she has a little kennel with a nice bed in it and everything. And so I'm like, time to go to bed. And she will like veer off and go back to the couch. I'm like, no, 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 that's not it. And then she flops down and like stretches out with her feet under the couch. And I'm like, 
Get, drag the dog. Get up. Go this way. Go the way I am pointing you. I'm pointing you to a good spot. This way, you will not get in trouble, and you will have a nice, soft place to sleep, and I will not scream at you when you wake me up at 3 a.m. because you've eaten all the shoes. Okay? Just go here. It is good for you. I promise. Don't do the wrong thing. Don't turn the wrong way. And as we go, I have to like walk like this and like, nope, nope, not, not, not that way. And just go the way I'm telling you. It's the right way to go. That's what God is saying. Just follow me. Just go the way I'm showing you. And then this covenant will happen. But you just got to trust me. Do you trust me? Or are you going to keep pull, pulling for these like half-baked blessings? You want that Ishmael blessing or you want what I actually promised you? Because I'm going to make a whole people out of Ishmael, but everyone's going to hate him. And it's going to be the wrong way because it's not following me. And his whole legacy is going to be against my people. They were conceived in rebellion. They will live in rebellion. They're going to stay rebellious. Fun fact, the line of Ishmael is where Islam traces its lineage. It has a lasting legacy to this day of rebellion against God. Abraham fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham. Abram means exalted father. Abraham means exalted father of many I'm telling you, I'm changing your name. Like, you need to reconsider your entire identity in me and in what I'm doing with you. For I've made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. The whole land of Canaan, where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give as an everlasting possession to you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. And then God said to Abraham, and as for you, you must keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you for the generations to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. Remember, he's speaking to a 99-year-old. I don't know if you know very many of those, but like you're not looking forward real far into the future. If you're 99, you're not thinking of like legacies that you will witness for decades to come. This is my covenant with you and your descendants after you. The covenant you are to keep. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You are to undergo circumcision, and, you will be, and it will be the sign of the covenant between me and you. For generations to come, every male among you who is eight days old must be circumcised, including those born in your household or bought with money from a foreigner. Those who are not your offspring, whether born in your household or bought with your money, they must be circumcised. My covenant in your flesh is to be an everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who has not been circumcised in the flesh will be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. If you will not be cut off symbolically through this thing, which is a really intense physical process for, you know, adults. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to do this to an eight-day-old eight baby. Um, but I, 99-year-old man, getting in line for that, that's rough. Um, but God says, if you won't do this, if you will not take this symbol of being cut off, and separate, I will cut you off. You can be the whole body, or you can be what's thrown out after. Your choice. God also said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you will no longer call her Sarai. You'll name her, her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. Kings of peoples will come from her. And Abraham fell, Abraham fell face down and he laughed and said to himself, will a son be born to a man a hundred years old? Will Sarah bear a child at the age of 90? And Abraham said to God, if only Ishmael might live under your blessing. And God said, yes. But your wife, Sarah, will bear you a son, and you will call him Isaac, which means he laughs. You laugh at me? Fine. Name your kid laughter. 
Keep going. Let's see how far we can play this game. I will establish my covenant with him as an everlasting covenant for his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I heard you. I will surely bless him. I will make him fruit loop. Not fruit loop. I will make him fruitful. And he will greatly increase, and I will greatly increase his numbers. And he will be the father of 12 rulers. And I will make him into a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah will bear to you by this time next year. And when he had finished speaking with Abraham, God went up from him. And on that very day, Abraham took his son Ishmael and all those born in his household or bought with his money every male and circumcised them as God told him. Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised and his son Ishmael was 13. That's a bar mitzvah to remember. And Abraham and his son Ishmael were both circumcised on that very day. And every male in Abraham's household, including those born in his house or bought, were circumcised with him. So Abraham does that, and then the Lord shows up again right away. The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day, and Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. And when he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. He said, if I found favor in your eyes, my Lord, do not pass your servant by. Let a little water be brought, and then you may all wash your feet and rest under this tree. Let me get you something to eat, and you can be refreshed, and then go on your way, now that you've come to your servant. Very well, do as you say. So Abraham, Abraham hurried into the tent to Sarah. Quick, get three sails of the finest flour and knead it and bake some bread. That's not what he said. He said, I'll get water for you to drink and wash your feet. And they're like, make them cakes. Then he ran to the herd and selected a choice tender calf and gave it to a servant who hurried to prepare it. So now he's throwing a barbecue. He then brought some curds and milk and the calf that had been prepared and set these before them. While they ate, he stood near them under a tree. Where's your wife, Sarah? They asked him. Oh, she's there in the tent, he said. Then one of them said, I will surely return to you about this time next year. And Sarah, your wife, will have a son. Now Sarah was listening at the entrance to the tent, which was behind him. Abraham and Sarah were already very old. Sarah was past the age of childbearing. So Sarah laughed to herself as she thought, after I'm worn out and my Lord is old, will I now have this pleasure? Then the Lord said to Abraham, why did Sarah laugh and say, will I really have a child now that I'm old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? I will return to you at the appointed time next year, and Sarah will have a son. And Sarah was afraid. So she lied and said, I didn't laugh. She said, yes, you did. Don't argue with the Lord. It's a bad idea. He'll name your kid. Don't laugh at me. Last piece. Chapter 21. A whole bunch of stuff happens. You can read the intervening chapters. Sodom and Gomorrah are destroyed. Lot turns out to be kind of horrible. And so are his kids. Now the Lord was gracious to Sarah. And as he had said, the Lord did for Sarah what he had promised. Sarah became pregnant and bore a son to Abraham in his old age. At the very time God had promised him, Abraham gave the name Isaac to the son Sarah bore him. And when his son Isaac was eight days old, Abraham circumcised him as God commanded him. When Abraham was a hundred years old, Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born to him. Sarah said, God has brought me laughter and everyone who hears about this will laugh with me. And she added, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah would nurse children? Yet I have borne him a son in his old age. Abraham was 75 years old when God said, go, I'm going to do this new thing with you. He's already an old man. He's already feeling past his prime. At 86, he gives up on waiting for this promise from God. And he has a son with her servant. And God says, that's not what I meant. At 99, he's given the promise and he barely believes it, but he's trying to trust in God. And he's continually faithful. He, he turns and is faithful to God. He believes God and it counts as righteousness. At 100 years old, when Sarah is 90, God's promise is fulfilled. 25 years, started late in life, and then 25 years later, God comes through. And 
And they almost missed it because they almost got too impatient. And they almost tried to trust in their own way of doing something that sort of sounded like what God was saying. Like I said, God keeps bringing this up in my life. Before we moved to Tucson, I knew, we were, I knew God was calling us to something else. And so we set ourselves up. We resigned. We were ready to go. And we just said, I don't know where we're going, but God, you have something for us. And I had some friends who were looking out for me and, and you know, some professors from Bible school and some other things that were trying to find me a job. And I had one, I had an interview lined up that was like almost a sure thing. And, uh, and it was going to be up in Reno and it was going to be this, this whole deal. And for whatever reason, that meeting fell through. Like everybody else that was supposed to be part of that meeting couldn't make it. And so it was called off. And we were talking about when to reschedule. And I was just praying about it because at the time I was also interviewing with this church in Tucson. And I'd gone through a bunch of really great interviews. And then I just got crickets for like two weeks. And like, if you're having an interview every other day and like conversations about things moving forward every other day, and then nobody says anything to you and there's no progress for two weeks, it's like, now I'm just waiting for the like denial letter in the mail or something, you know, like, I'm like that avenue seems dead to me now. So I'm trying to figure it out and I'm, and I'm talking with people that I know and I'm trying to look up contact info for people who have connections around. And I'm trying to figure out where we're going next. And, and I just start praying about it because I'm so discouraged because like everything is just falling flat and nobody's got anything for me and it, all these things are falling. And I had this meeting that seemed really good and it fell apart. And then the other guy who was supposed to be there like was kind of like, I don't even know why we're trying to meet. And it's like, dude, I thought this was like a whole like fruitful potential thing and you know, it's not going to happen at all. And <laughs> I'm starting to get anxious. And I'm trying to work it out. And I'm just praying like, God, just let me do that thing. Why aren't you letting me do it? Like, why didn't that work out? And God spoke to me as I was praying and said, do you want Ishmael or do you want Isaac? I want Isaac. <laughs> like, do I have to be 99? <laughs> Struggling to be patient here, Lord. But I want Isaac. I want the promise you have. I don't want a half-baked version of it. And I said, okay. And he said, well, just wait. Okay. And we've got all this pressure. Like, everybody we know is asking us, like, when are you going to get a job? What are you doing? Like, what? Like, you need to think about your family. Like, what are you guys doing? And I tell Mandy, I say, God's telling me to wait. And we need to just wait. I'm going to stop chasing down everything. I'm going to call off everybody that I had looking for something, and we're just going to wait and see what God does. That's what I felt he was telling me to do. And she goes, okay, if that's what God's saying, let's do that. Let's be faithful in this. And it's scary. And we did it because we trust God. And we said, okay, let's do that. And when we said that, and we, I think we prayed really briefly, just, all right, Lord, we trust you. We put this in your hands. Amen. My phone buzzed. I pulled my phone out of my pocket, and it was the church in Tucson. And, hey, okay, sorry about all this. We just haven't been able to work out schedules, but we want to set up an interview day after tomorrow. Great. Do the interview, and at the end of that interview, they said, hey, we have a plane ticket for you. We want to bring you guys down. We want to look. We want to make sure that this is a good fit. And God ended up taking us down there, and it was great. And I don't like living in the desert, but it was a phenomenal church and, and a, uh, a great city. And, and we got to do cool ministry and God moved in, in that. And if not for that and what we got there, we wouldn't have been in the right place to come back here and start this church. And there were a whole bunch more scenarios like that throughout that move and throughout that. But over and over, God kept calling to mind this idea of timing and this truth that Look, if you're not dead, God's not done with you. And what feels like it's slow is nothing to the God who, to whom a thousand years is like a day. He's fully aware of your situation. He knows how old you are. He knows how long you've been waiting. He knows all of the pressures on you to do things and to move forward. He knows absolutely everything. 
He knows things about your response that you don't even recognize or aren't willing to acknowledge. And he's not in a rush. He's got it. Are you willing to step out by faith and trust in what God has for you? Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. As we pray, I want to, I just want to read a couple scriptures to you as we take some time to pray and, and prepare ourselves for communion. Because Jesus died for you, not just for the personal satisfaction of like, ah, my sins are forgiven. We There's a purpose for that. Your redemption comes with a calling. Jesus called his disciples together after his resurrection and said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. And then he sent his disciples to pray and wait on the Holy Spirit that they would be empowered to do this because this call is not a call that can be done by man's power. And it is not a call that is unique to people who sign up to be staff members at churches or who step up as evangelists and pastors, but every single believer is called to be a disciple and disciples multiply and make more disciples. Peter passed that on and said in 1 Peter 3, in your hearts revere Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. We are called to make disciples. You are called to make disciples. What does that look like for you today to stand and and step forward by faith, trusting that all of my past mistakes still can be redeemed. All of my wanderings off the path can still be brought back into alignment. And all of my failures and maybe aggressively sharing or unnecessarily causing offense can be forgiven in every embarrassment or persecution or attack or insult or slander against you because you live for Christ is to your glory, to the glory of God. There is no one here that God cannot and will not use. We follow him. Thanks for listening today. We hope this blessed you and that God spoke to you. We'd like to connect with you. You can find us at paxchristian.church and fill out the digital connect card or find us on social media as Pax Christian Church on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram. If this message spoke to you today, would you consider sharing this message with someone? Maybe tell a neighbor or a friend. Maybe leave a review and let others know what this has done for you. May you be inspired and transformed by God's Spirit as you step out into this world to declare that there is peace with God for everybody through our Lord Jesus Christ.